To be perfectly honest with you, I don't know how many years I've been able to see the creatures that live in the woods. It is just as far as long as I can remember. It certainly started when I was just a child. I was never frightened by them, likely, because they never appeared threatening. Not to me, anyway. I think to start with, I thought they were fairies. You see, they were very small, and I was only a young, petite girl. But some of them seemed not much bigger than my dolls. They never let me fully see them, just snatched glimpses here and there. I loved to play with them. I called it playing, anyway. Imagined it was a game of hide-and-seek. I wasn't as though they'd actively participate. I liked to pretend that they enjoyed it, too. They never showed me any malicious intent. Yet, even as a very young child, I seemed to instinctively know that I was not to talk about them, that I must never tell anyone of their existence. And I didn't. I honestly never felt the need to tell somebody. But those were simpler times. And as an only child, I would often spend hours in the woods as they were just behind the houses, close enough for me to hear my mother call me back for food. I had a good life. I often heard the word lucky being thrown around. We were lucky. Dad had that bonus and had bought us a VCR. We were lucky that our aunt had left my mother some money, and we went abroad on holiday. And I had my fairy friends. All would be fine, so long as I never told anybody. Whether I put two and two together and chose to ignore it, whether I honestly had no idea, I still didn't mention them to anybody that when some of the local pets went missing. Within the space of a few months, two cats and one small dog, belonging to an older lady at the end of the street, disappeared and were later on found in the woods. When I say found, I mean parts were found. The majority of each animal had been eaten, covered in bite and tear marks. The locals thought it to be a fox. That was the only likely suspect. We don't have wolves, bears, cougars, etc. The worst that can then happen is you catch a chill, as the woods are always so cold and damp. But a fox can and will kill small pets. Just for fun sometimes. People were more vigilant. You know, just about keeping pets inside. And for a while, things seemed okay. And then the bad luck started up again. They called it bad luck, because it was little things that couldn't really be blamed on anything else. But there was still a particular tiresome issue. Flat tires. Missing food. Gardens destroyed. There was a spate of little occurrences over the next few weeks. And I could remember my mother standing on the doorstep, cup of tea in one hand, cigarette in the other, although she's given up years ago. She was chatting to the neighbor, who had huge bags under her eyes, about a noise that was waking her up every morning at 5 a.m. that she just couldn't get to the bottom of. That day, when I went into the woods, the little people didn't want to play, and that was when I started to get suspicious. So, I did something that an eight-year-old who was missing her friends seemed perfectly reasonable. Although, now looking back as an adult, racks me with guilt. I took them an offering. Miss Stone had an old grumpy tabby cat who hated everybody. It was little more than a bag of bones with fur, as it was so old, and when it wasn't sleeping... It would just hiss at you when you walked by. When it was younger, and I was really small, it terrified me. So when I saw it sleeping on the doorstep, somehow, having snuck out of the house, I took my chance. 
and it barely weighed anything and couldn't even be bothered to scratch me. Just hissed a few times as I ran with it into the woods. I heard them as soon as I got to our spot. I had stood holding the cat and I heard the trees rustle. I knew they were there. They were watching me. I'm not exactly proud of what I did next. I threw the cat into the bushes and ran. Ran as fast as I could. Into my house. Up into my bedroom. A couple of days later, I heard my mom consoling our neighbor, saying it was likely the cat had wandered off to die, as they were apt to do. My neighbor was very attached to that cat, but she did receive some good news that her son and daughter-in-law were expecting a baby after a year of trying. I stopped going into the woods as I got older. Teenage life does take over. Then, I went to college and moved away. But, I still often hear about my mother talk about how you have to be careful if you walk through the woods using the shortcut to the shops. That there are often dead rabbits and squirrels around. Funny, that in all those years, they'd never actually seen what Fox was responsible for, though. I am a teacher in a primary school in the UK right now. Every year, we take a group of 11-year-olds to an outdoor recreation center, teaching them lifelong survival skills and team building. It's a lot of fun and both the students and staff have a blast. As staff, we are always trying to find new activities to try out with the kids, testing their skills and mindsets. It isn't always meant to be easy, sometimes doing something out of their comfort zone, but in a controlled environment is imperative in overcoming fear, which was how I found myself checking out some caves a few miles away just from the residential center and seeing if they would be safe enough and appropriate to use when we took the next lot of our kids up there in just a couple months. Now, of course, these were 11 year olds. Most of them will have never even seen a cave, let alone have gone spelunking. So we were not expecting them to suddenly become experts, but being taken into the cold and dark with the correct safety equipment and a trusted adult can alley any fears. I was all tooled up, resplendent with a hard hat and light attached in hiking boots. I hadn't planned to go too far, as in although I had done this several times, one fall and you could be stranded. This was purely a reconnaissance expedition. Sometimes though, we got caught up in things and don't realize how far we've gone or how long it has been. Time seemed to fly by and there and before I knew it, I was pretty deep into a cavern of tunnels and quite away from the mouth of the cave. Of course, that would be the exact time the batteries in the hard hat started to flicker, indicating I needed to change them. Thank God I'd had the foresight to pack some more. It did mean that I was plunged into total darkness for a few seconds, whilst I removed one set and replaced them as quickly as I could. And in just those few seconds, I heard a noise. Now, as well as being a teacher and keen explorer, I'm also an avid reader. And yes, horror is one of my favorite genres. So upon hearing that noise, I can honestly say that the thoughts of Tommy Knockers and cave dwelling demons came to my mind pretty quickly. It was sort of a high pitched screech. Now, here in the UK, we don't have bears or indeed any kind of man eating animals that live in our cave systems. Bats, of course, but I hadn't heard of any flapping or felt the rush of wind from wings. So, I didn't think this was being made by them. Following all the classic foibles, I dropped the second battery and now had to scrape about in the dark to find it. 
The screech then turned into a growl, and I knew then for sure that I was not alone. Still grabbing around the floor, I could hear movement, and I damn near crapped myself. Finally, I got the battery and managed to slot it in and turn the torch back on. I pushed my back up against the cave wall as far as I could, somehow imagining that it might protect me from whatever was here with me and making that noise. I knew I had to look before I made a run for it. I had to know what it was. So I turned and looked. I can honestly say two things. The first, I have never been more terrified in my entire life. And two, I have absolutely no idea what it was that I saw. Have you ever seen the film The Descent? Well, there are some cave-dwelling creatures in that which are the only thing I can think of akin to what I saw. Lighting and shadow play a huge part in distorting size and features, and the fact that I was beyond petrified means that even my memories are now not 100% reliable. But the thing in front of me appeared to be of average human height. It was that same awful pallid albino color, same as the creatures in the film, appearing entirely hairless. I couldn't make out any eyes or even where the eye should be on its misshapen head. Only some sort of holes for a nose, and I presume mouth. It was on two feet, and appeared humanoid enough, like it had limbs like a person. Only the torso was deformed and twisted. And then it made that screech again, and I was able to pull myself out of my frozen and terror cliché and run as fast as I possibly could, back to the mouth of the cave and out of there. I only stopped running when I had reached my car, and even then, it was key in the ignition and go. I can't even recall when I stopped shaking. After I had climbed down, the more practical side of my brain took over, and I began hunting for a reasonable explanation for what it is that I saw. The air is thinner down there, and I had been in the darkness save for the torchlight for hours. After the mishap with the batteries, it was far more likely that I suffered some form of hallucination. Lack of oxygen, maybe. Lights playing tricks on my eyes. That must have been the cause. Just to be sure, though, I reported back to the school that the caves were dangerous too many potholes and chances of kids tripping and hurting. That was enough to knock it off the agenda, so we never took the kids there, and I have never been back. I mean, I'm 99% sure it was an overactive horror fan's imagination, coupled with extenuating circumstances. But what if it wasn't? What if I really did see and hear that thing down there? I'm convinced I was, even though I try and force myself not to believe it. I thought I would send my story into you, and you can tell me what you make of it. I was around 12 or 13, the night we were driving through a storm, and I saw this thing standing by the side of the road. I was in the back of the car with my two younger siblings, who at the time were both fast asleep. My mother was driving, knuckles white from gripping the steering wheel so hard and on the verge of giving herself a migraine, just from concentrating too much. The rain was lashing down the windscreen, and it must have been awful just trying to keep from falling over. My dad at the time was riding shotgun, desperately trying to read the map face screwed up in concentration as he turning it around and trying to see any tiny markings with the only smallest amount of light. You were either lost or close to it, and they were trying to make as much time as they could, driving through the Pine Barrens, so we can try and find a B and B or a motel to stay in, until the storm passed the next day. 
thunder and lightning continued and decided to join the driving rain and high gust of wind. My poor mother jumped every time there's a clap, her speed sometimes reducing to almost a crawl. She was very aware that her three children were in the back of the car, and she would do nothing to place us in danger. After another flash of lightning, I looked out my window on the passenger's side, sitting behind my father. Since we were cruising along at the pace of a person for a leisurely jog, I got a good glimpse of him, the creature on the road. Two strikes of lightning, one after the other, illuminated the sky in the area, just enough for me to be able to make out his features. He was tall, stood on two legs, just like a person, and as tall as a person, like my dad would be. He looked like he was gray, not wearing gray, as he wasn't wearing clothes, like his whole skin was gray. He had long skinny arms that were just dangling by his side. His head looked like a mixture, or maybe a horse and goat. I know that sounds weird, but believe me, everything about this thing was weird. And just to top it all off, I remember him having huge bat wings that again looked like they were covered in gray skin. Unbelievably, nobody else saw it. Okay, so mom was on the driver's side and mad concentrating on the road and not killing us. But dad? Even though he had his nose stuck in the map, I couldn't believe he hadn't noticed this thing, that his eyes hadn't been drawn to the road when the lightning struck. But it was just me. Looking back, I wish I would have shouted. Even if I had been told off for waking up my brothers and sisters, at least I would have had some sort of evidence. Validation. But, to be honest, I was too shocked and scared to even be able to speak. I turned around so I could see out of the back when there was another bolt of lightning. But the next strike wasn't as big and didn't light up the road as much. I couldn't see him. We weren't from that area, and until I did some research after we got home, I hadn't even heard of the term cryptid. But now, it would seem that I had a rare sighting of what I know to be the Jersey Devil. It is real. This one thing happened to me a few years ago, and I will never forget and have never been able to explain. I'm writing into you, as I wonder if one of your listeners might be able to tell me something more about it, or if they have ever had a similar experience. I was driving someone from the gym, which I joined in town, and it was fairly dark, but not pitch black. I live a little bit out of the main town, out towards the countryside. At some point, in the journey, I noticed that there was a dog on the side of the road, just ahead of me. A very big dog. I was mindful of it, as the last thing that I wanted was for it to run out, and also a little surprised that I couldn't see any owner anywhere. As I got closer to it, I could see just how large it was. More like the size of a small horse but it was shaped definitely like a dog. Very wolf-like. It was also very dark in fur. Black, I would say. But it was really hard to make out. Mostly just the outline in the absence of any real lighting. As I drove past, I remember thinking, I wouldn't want to take that thing for a walk. It stared right at me as I drove past. And I swear... Although it sounds impossible, that it had glowing red eyes. But nothing has red eyes, right? I felt very uncomfortable, although I couldn't place why. And despite wanting to be careful to not run into this beast, I guess. Yes, now I thought of it as a beast due to the size. 
I also put my foot down on the accelerator to get out of there ASAP. And it ran. This thing ran alongside my car. I sped up to about 50 miles an hour. And that dog, it stayed with me. Not looking at the road, looking right into my car. Right at me with those huge eyes. I sped up faster to 70, starting to feel out of control on that windy road, but needing to lose this animal. That was what it now felt like. There was no way this thing was something from our world. I was convinced. Finally, letting out a horrendous howl, like something you'd see in a werewolf movie, it jumped off into the woods and vanished. I didn't let my speed up for more than a few seconds or miles until I was sure it was no longer beside me. I was still going too fast, but a speeding ticket was the least of my concerns right then. Thankfully, I made it home in one piece. The only thing I could think of was the hound of the Baskervilles. You know, the old Sherlock Holmes story. I don't know what that thing was. But I can tell you with certainty, it wasn't a normal dog. It looked more like something sent straight from hell. Can you help me? I live in the Norfolk in the UK. Thanks. My wife and I had been fighting much more often. We both came home at the same time one Friday, looked at each other, just as soon as we felt the bickering washing up to the surface. And that's when we knew. We had to get out. Whatever it took. No matter how much work wouldn't get done over the weekend. We needed to get away from the hustle and bustle. And spend some time being around each other. In a way that didn't compel us to fight. I had been working just hard enough. Just long enough to own a little getaway cabin. About two hours away. It wasn't as remote as I would have preferred, but it would do the job. We arrived and settled in with Grace of a plane crash. There was no romantic carrying her over the threshold. We looked like two cats finding a place to curl up after crossing a warehouse full of rocking chairs. My wife hit the bed after we downed our Chinese food, and she was out pretty quick. We would catch up with each other in the morning, I suppose. I turned on the TV, making sure that my wife's slumber would not be disturbed. I think she could have slept through a helicopter landing at that point. I was just starting to feel my eyelids growing heavy when the sound of my wife's voice made me jump. She was calling to me. I snapped my head to her, but she was unconscious. Had she called me on in her sleep? No. It sounded too far away. But it couldn't have been anybody else's voice. She called me by my name. Then, I heard her call me again. Her voice was drifting in from the open screen window to the outside. She urged me to come outside to help her carry something. The only rational explanation was that either my wife had a twin who was standing outside or that the woman in the bed that I sat on was an imposter. She was the same person that had been with me all day, so I sided with her. I felt my forehead for any hint that I might be getting a fever and thus prone to any auditory hallucinations. But no, I felt fine. If it really was just some prankster or joker, then there wouldn't be any need to do anything. They'd get bored and move on. Well, they didn't. The voice of my wife grew more urgent, but still stayed as low, as if they were also making an effort to not awaken my real wife. When this glimmer of insight flashed into my brain, I decided to do just that. I gently nudged my wife and urged her to wake up. I almost thought that I wasn't going to be able to, but she gradually stirred, and I spoke to her to bring her up out of wherever she was. 
she wasn't happy to be bothered. I told her that somebody was outside and they were calling to me by name and they sounded just like her. In that moment, her eyes started to open. I heard a peculiar sound come from the window, the sound of compressed air escaping. I must have attributed it to our vehicle at first because looking back, it sounded like some kind of hiss of frustration. Whoever, whatever was out there, must not have considered me to be very bright and seemed dismayed that I didn't rush headlong into their situation. I walked as quietly as I could across the floor and made sure the door was locked, just in case our visitor was up for more than just Miles' monkey shines. The door held fast, and I let go a little tension from my shoulders. When I turned around, my wife was looking at me, wide awake. She could tell that I was serious. Then, both of us were jolted at the same time, because a different voice came from down the hallway. It was the voice of our daughter. She was calling for us, the way any child calls after they've woken up after a bad dream. My wife, I'll never forget, put her hands to her face and let out a yelp before she can control herself. Me. I felt anger in an instant, but not without a measure of fear. There, my pulse became audible, and I followed the direction of the voice to the other bedroom. I jumped a second time when our daughter's voice spoke again. That's when I could see that the window in that bedroom was also open. I shut it, and that's when I heard a terrible commotion coming from where I had left my wife. She was yelling, one short step away from hysterics, judging by her tone. And there was the sound of the front door being pounded on and the doorknob rattling. I came running as if I would suddenly find that the front door was unlocked. No, it held fast, despite the fury of the stranger on the other side. My wife was very unnerved at this point. I couldn't tell if I was mad or afraid. We hunkered down until morning, and somehow I managed to fall asleep, even though I didn't think we'd be able to. We were both overcome with so much fear. When it was fully daylight, I stepped outside to see if our visitor had done any vandalism while we were locked in a standoff. Our car and everything was left alone. We did find some unusual footprints around the property and the places that I know for sure the stranger had stood, especially under the other bedroom window. There weren't the footprints of anyone wearing shoes or boots though, the weather had been dry, so the prints, sadly, weren't starkly cast in mud. But the prints we could find seemed to have three or four large toes. They looked very much like animal prints, which raised more questions than answers. Also, this detail is very disturbing. The prints we could make out appeared to be bipedal, and not quadrupedal, meaning this thing was walking on two legs. The real problem was how they knew what our daughter sounded like. Bless her soul, she hasn't been with us for four years. She was killed by a drunk driver. Whoever this was that paid us a visit that night must have not known that something happened to her. Honestly, I don't know if this is some freak hallucination trip Maybe my wife had slipped me some LSD. Or maybe we had some sort of supernatural traumatic experience. I'll let you decide for me. After way too many years of living in apartments, I could finally afford to buy a house. The house really wasn't much bigger than an apartment 
but the difference is apparent to anyone that's been doing this as long as I have. One day, I would own it. And that day was going to be sooner than later, because I had saved plenty for the down payment. Most stories like this tell about something strange, like a strange phenomena during the night on the first night. I didn't have that kind of trouble. It was a peaceful place, and I loved it. In fact, I slept soundly, knowing that one day it would be entirely mine in less than a decade. I got to know the places intimately as a child begins to know the layout of their own body. I didn't discover anything unusual, except for what appeared to be the entrance to a crawl space underneath the house. The location was most peculiar. It was in the bedroom wall by the baseboards. Rather than crawling underneath the house like a proper crawl space, it seemed to go between the walls. It was very strange, and I had no idea why it was even necessary although it was an older house. There was a lid, heavy enough to have been a component of a wood stove sealing the crawl space. It was held in place with four large screws. Getting those screws to turn, though, was murder. It was like they had been either over-torqued or they had rusted in place years ago. But I got them off, and I shone a flashlight around the entrance to the crawl space. Nothing out of the ordinary. You know, like no skulls or bodies or anything like that. So I screwed everything back into place and paid it no more mind. The night after opening the crawl space was a strange one. I was about to drift off to sleep when I heard a very light sound that I couldn't quite put my finger on. It was the slightest, most distant scraping sound. I woke up when it was followed by the sound of something hitting the wood floor. I was tired, and it was easy to write off as something I either dreamed of or something inconsequential. But I heard both sounds a second time when I tried to drift off. I turned on the light and looked around, unsure of what it was or what I was even looking for. I was always light on possessions. I didn't have anything to fall from anywhere. As I lay down, I heard the sounds return. It hit me. I got up and turned on the light. I took a look at the crawl space. Two of the four screws had been removed and laid on the floor, while a third one was sticking out, as if it were in the middle of being unscrewed. This began a game I had to play every night the screws would unscrew themselves, and I would put them back in. This became a source of anxiety. I wasn't sure what would be happening if all four screws came undone. Suppose I were to sleep through such a thing. What would I be confronted with? No matter how I tightened or glued, I was still alerted to the mild grinding of the screws turning and then the thunk of them hitting the floor. This ate away at my nerves more than I care to admit. Not until I took the extra step of welding the screws in place, knowing full well that this would deny me any use of the crawl space. Did I get any peace, though? No. The first night after my new measure, I heard a bizarre sound coming from behind the place. Suppose you had the sound of someone crying, but it was done in whispers. There was a light tapping and scratching, even after the strange sobs, and then the noise seemed to disappear. The anxiety from that experience has never left. There's a part of me that still listens for the screws turning when I'm drifting off to sleep. There was really no slow buildup to what happened to me. I was taking the garbage out into the narrow alleyway behind my place of work. Something about two heads shorter than me was rummaging around in our dumpster. The sound of the back door opening got its attention right away, and it fixed me with a face that seemed to borrow elements from both the insect kingdom 
and the reptile kingdom. The eyes were reptilian, but the overall structure of the body seemed to be as well. The shoulders were badly hunched. The frame reminded me of an armadillo trying to walk on its hind legs. The head was a few sizes too small, looking like a basketball with huge slitted eyes. The mouth reminded me of something you'd see on a praying mantis. It was when I saw that mouth that I couldn't help shouting an alarm. Again, just like a mantis, it was grinding away at whatever that it had found deemed edible. It might have been easier to stomach if I hadn't been wearing clothes. The clothing, however ragged, suggested that it wasn't just a dumb exotic animal. It was intelligent and incredibly hideous. It caught me off guard and deep down, my instincts sent me into fight or flight. I must have had a similar effect on it because it dropped whatever it was eating from its nubby clawed fingers and let out this terrible scream, something that reminded me of a cicada when you get too close to them. It appeared to waddle backwards. The slits of its eyes, I'll never forget. They appeared to be darting about. Here's where it gets really bizarre. It stuck its hand out and appeared to do some sort of bizarre gesture. There was nothing for me to cease doing. I was counting its fingers as it was weirdly moving its hand about. I then felt something hit me all over the entire surface of my body, like a shockwave or a blast of heat from an oven. My vision was blurred and swam, and then literally every last object in my field of vision sprouted faces and screamed until I thought my skull would shatter. I curled up into a ball on the pavement, which was now swimming with screaming faces. After what felt like hours, I stood up, but it had only been maybe two, three minutes. Aside from questioning what sort of living thing I had just encountered, I also wondered, had I just been on the receiving end of some sort of occult magic spell or hex, or perhaps some sort of pheromone or chemical attack, like a beetle that sprays liquid at a predator? Did that thing, whatever it was, use some sort of defense mechanism to incapacitate me. I searched my persons to find that no chemicals or other strange substances had been left anywhere on me or around me, which then guided me to the conclusion that it had used some level of sorcery or some sort of pheromone. As you probably know, this isn't really a story I can share freely, since our location is notorious for psychedelic drug use. I am one of the few people that have never tried any of this stuff. Whatever I saw was real. Whatever it did to me was real. It's not like I jumped at my own shadow. Just in case you decide to broadcast my story, I'm going to go on the record and say that I think I had come across something from one of the lowest castes in reptilian society. Even though it was foraging maybe it still had a talent for deception and illusion, which does line up with most of what I've read about reptilians. They aren't just out there. They're living everywhere without us knowing. We never even see them. Anyway, that's my story. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm a retired park ranger and I'm one of those rangers that they almost wouldn't let me retire because I was that good at everything I did on the job. I know every ranger says that probably, and I don't mean to boast, but I've actually got papers and articles to back it up. If anyone vanished or disappeared on my watch, I'm the one that found them at the time, or at the very least it was my advice that led to them being discovered. I had a pretty solid career behind me, so nothing really shakes me up. Well, I got shaken up. 
like all the heroes you see in a movie. I retired somewhere in the country, got a lot of animals. In my case, I settled for just a few chickens. You can't go wrong with fresh eggs. I got to know my animals just about as well as any cat or dog I could have owned. The first surprise was when I came outside one morning to check on my hens and saw the coop was a mess of blood and feathers. Now, chickens can be unpredictable in their own way. One minute they're okay and chill, and the next minute they're turning on one of their own, kind of like people around election season. But taking a closer look, I noticed that none of the surviving birds had any sign that they had taken part in the grizzly deed. The coop that I had constructed is solid. Once the gate is shut, there's no way in or out unless some animal was an absolute acrobat that could climb to the very top of three concrete walls, drop down that was shaped like a chimney. Actually, the coop had been a chimney at one point in time. The old house on the property burned down, and the stone chimney was all that was left. But I had the inside of the chimney blocked off too, so nothing except for a very determined Santa Claus would have been able to climb up, jump down, and unseal the fence wiring that plugged the opening. I had just decided that the hens had been especially sneaky and vicious, and that they would get away with murder this time. Less than two days later, the same thing happened. Two more hens bit the dust. Like I said, I don't have a very big congregation of chickens. This was beginning to eat into my daily egg production. The ground was still a little wet, so I did an inspection on the outside of my improvised chicken coop. I found something that didn't quite make sense. I did find footprints. Here's the thing. They were not animal. They were human. They were also small like a child's. Okay, so there's a mischievous kid on the run. But why would he be out in his bare feet, so early in the morning in the middle of nowhere, where there's just my home? The second surprise came when I saw that the footprints were also found on the side of the chimney, all the way to the top. The footprints that were on the ground were also on the side of the chimney, meaning that the child had not shimmied his way up the chimney or grappled up the side. It was as if he had walked like Spider-Man. I started to feel a pit in my stomach that I couldn't place. It took me a minute, but I found the trail of tracks leading off my property. I was going to track them right back to where they came from, but they disappeared. So I backtracked and found the trail of tracks where they originated. I followed my visitor's excursion backwards. This is the part where I can tell you only what I saw, not what I think, because there are some things that I avoid thinking about. The tracks led me down a lone road, and the further along I got, the thicker the timber became on both sides. And at one point, the trail eventually led off into the woods, to a thick area of brush that I couldn't get to, which means a small child would have no chance. I was clueless and terrified. What exactly I had been dealing with, I wasn't sure. Where I live is the literal definition of living out in the sticks. I don't have any neighbors for probably a good 10 miles anywhere close to me, and I live that far out there. So who or what on earth could it have been getting into my chicken coop? Like I said, I live very far out of any near community, so there's no excuses as to a child walking around late at night. I'm kind of freaked out. I usually don't tell a lot of people this, but I personally believe that I've seen a dead chupacabra on the side of the road. Last year, my job entailed me to drive from different locations across New Mexico. I've been to Nevada and around the area. 
I prefer that my job details stay more private as I'm not comfortable sharing any of that sensitive information. I will say though, at the time, I smoked like a chimney and cannot smoke in my company vehicle in which I drove. So I would often make frequent stops along the side of the road to light one up. It's not what I wanted to do, but I didn't have a choice. I do remember this event quite well though. I was probably about 80 or so miles outside of Tucson, headed east, and it was getting a little dusky outside. I pulled over on the side of the road for a smoke, and I thought I would sit outside my car and enjoy the cool evening breeze. Well, what am I kidding, it's Arizona, there ain't nothing cool about it, but it was at least a breeze nonetheless. It had been at least 4 or 5 hours since my last smoke break anyway, since I was trying to make good time to my next location. I figure I had a good five or so minutes to spare since I was going over the speed limit. I'm sitting there, smoking my cigarette, looking off in the distance when my eye catches something on the ground, probably about 50 feet away from me in the dirt. I don't know why I didn't catch it at first, but it looked to be like a dead animal or some sort. Not really anything surprising since animals die all the time out here. The conditions are extreme, and this is a busy road. But the more I'm looking at it, the more my brain is having a hard time registering what animal this could be. My brain just can't configure the puzzle pieces right, and it's left me confused. After about 30 seconds of trying to figure this out, I just say screw it in my mind and throw my cigarette down. I walk on over there to see exactly what animal this is, and I'm surprised. I thought that coming up close to it, I would be able to rightfully say it was just a mangled coyote that had gotten ran over by a big truck, but this was an animal I was not familiar with. I have a couple of close native friends that I told the story to, and they told me that it sounds like I saw a dead skinwalker that had gotten hit by a semi-truck. I don't know. All the depictions I've ever seen of skinwalkers don't look anything like what I saw. This thing was smaller. Well, I don't want to say smaller, because it was still a larger animal. I'm going to tell you the size of a dog, because that makes the most sense, but more like a pit bull sized dog. The only problem is it had really short back legs, and long gangly forearms that formed into tiny three fingered hands that looked to even have claws on the end of them. It was very humanoid looking in the body, and the face was also much flatter than a dog's. It had two large fangs protruding from its mouth with sharper, rigid teeth in between. It looked to be whatever animal it was probably had mange or something. It looked to be somewhat fresh, the body, and was probably ran over in the last 12 to 15 hours, if I had to guess. Part of its body was contorted and crushed because it looks like it was the spot that had been ran over or hit. Part of its body was completely crushed, which is what I believe it died from and probably got knocked over or flew over off the road. I want to talk about the fangs though, because I've never in my life seen an animal with 3-4 to four inch canine like fangs hanging out of its mouth. This thing looked like a little mini vampire with exaggerated things, although physically it looked like a mixture of a dog and a human, if that makes sense. I'm not talking about no werewolf or anything like that. It looked more like a science experiment gone wrong like somebody was trying to make a monster and fuse dog DNA with human and it somehow got screwed up and died. I don't know, between the general abnormality of the monster and the fact that it was mangled from death by a semi truck, I couldn't give you an actual answer. Skinwalker or not, this thing was freaky to look at. I probably stood there and spent more time observing than I really should have. In fact, I probably freaked myself out too much because the more questions I had, the more I wanted to look at it. The more I wanted to look at it, the more questions I had. I had probably sat there for about 10 minutes before I left. It wasn't until a little later on that I kind of put two and two together and realized it was probably a chupacabra, if anything. It was after I watched the show on them that I really saw the resemblance and put it in my head that that is what it had to be. I didn't think they were real, but this thing must have been traveling at night and somehow gotten smacked by a truck oncoming. I guess I'm lucky that I saw it before the vultures and other wildlife ate through it. 
The weird thing was, though, that there were no flies or anything buzzing around it. There was also no smell or odor, and it was a blazing hot day. Just two things that stick out to me that are odd. I'll let you be the judge. Make of it what you will, but that's my experience, and it's one of those things that's going to forever kind of creep me out. About 10 years ago, I used to do some minor ranch handing and help around a few farms down in the general New Mexico area where I lived there for a short period of time. One farm that I remember very distinctly had a problem of supernatural proportion. They had a chupacabra problem, and I'm not afraid to come out and say it. I'm going to be blunt about it. I've never believed in ghosts or supernatural nonsense. I never paid attention to Bigfoot or any of that stuff, but what I encountered and experienced on that ranch, along with several others, I can't deny it anymore. There's nothing else this creature could have been, because no animal does what this thing did. It's unnatural, and I know for a fact that there is no predator on this God-given earth that drains the blood of animals like this thing did. For whatever reason, I'm not sure why these things... Yes, I say things because there were several of them. It wasn't just one singular thing. They would target the horses, and they would show up really early in the morning. I'm talking around 1 a.m. to 3 a.m., usually. They would show up in groups of 3 to 4 and break into the barn and stables. They managed to successfully take and kill two of our horses. When we found them the following morning, they had two large holes in their lower neck, and their bodies were completely drained of all blood. It was chilling to know that such an animal could do such a thing. I'll tell you what though, that event really made our owner up his firepower tenfold, and before you know it, we had a bunch of extra hired guards walking around fully armed with semi-automatic rifles. With all the extra muscle around for protection, I don't think we managed to kill even one of those things. I can tell you that I've probably heard several gunshots almost every night, if not every other night following. You would always know they were around because the horses would start going crazy in the stalls. You could tell they were really freaked out by something. Sure enough, the guards would go by and shine their lights, and there would be these little buggers. I shouldn't say little buggers. These things were probably the size of a small dog with large fangs. They kind of hunched over. The best way I can describe it is it kind of reminded me of a dog when you have a dog sit up and fold its paws in. You would usually only do this if you were to give a dog a treat, but that's what comes to mind. These things were gray and had a short snout with large fangs protruding at the front. Their eyes were large and dark and sunken in. I couldn't tell exactly what color, if there was any color, because the only time I saw them was when they generally reflected eye shine late at night. They were a true nuisance, and we dealt with them for quite some time. Things died down after a few months, but, but it was quite a while there that they really tried to get more horses, and they couldn't. Surprisingly, they never came after any of our other livestock. We had chickens, pigs, and several other livestock that, in my opinion, were in a much more vulnerable location than our horses. Maybe these things have it out for horses? Maybe they have a taste for horse meat. I don't know what you want to call it. When we found the two horses' bodies, there wasn't a lick of meat or blood anywhere on the horse. There were no signs of a struggle, no broken bones or gashes of any kind. Just the two large puncture holes in its neck. That's the kind of stuff that keeps you up at night, when you realize that this sort of thing is true. It's like I'm living in the X-Files. It makes you sit back and wonder, what else do they tell you is a lie? that is actually really out there and exists right now. Sure, these things never attacked us to try to go after us to my knowledge. I feel like given the chance, if they were backed into a corner, who knows what they would be capable of. My name is Mark and I'm part Cuban. My father is full-blooded Cuban and currently lives in Cuba while my mother is half Italian, half Portuguese. My mother and father met, had me, and then separated when I was really young. 
I didn't really grow up knowing my father since I moved to the United States with my mother when I was very young. She remarried very quickly to an American man, and I didn't really have much of a relationship with my real father growing up, that is, until my later teens. I'm now in my early 30s, and I've visited my father sometimes, but he mainly comes up here to visit every now and then, and we have a fantastic relationship. All of the family matters aside, he deals with a common problem that many local farmers in his area deal with, chupacabra. To give a little lesson to those that know nothing about the chupacabra, Spanish for goat sucker, these are beings that steal and kill livestock and suck the blood out of their bodies. My father has lost well over a dozen goats and several other livestock to these creatures over the years. I know this because when I call him, he's often complaining about it, not having the money and means to barter for more. I didn't really get to start to listening to creepy pastas and scary stories until I was older. So once I started to learn about this stuff while my dad's thing was going on, it was just kind of ringing a bell in my head. I've always been a big believer in cryptids and things you can't see, and having this happen firsthand is just downright terrifying. Even though I'm not experiencing it, my father is, and it is very, very real for him. He's just a simple man trying to get by on life, and these creatures are coming and killing off his animals. I don't think I really started to talk to him about them and really get his side of the story until I watched some chupacabra stuff myself reading a little bit of research and stories as well as watching encounters with them. That's when I decided to talk to my father more about it since he does believe they are chupacabras as well, but knows nothing of them beyond what he experiences with them. By that, I mean he hasn't read any encounters, hasn't been exposed to our American pop culture, he doesn't watch any documentaries or any sort of thing like that. He explains to me though that they have really large black eyes and long droopy fangs, tells me that they are of the devil and that they look like they've come from hell. These are the descendants of the night and they are here to scare and torment. I'm agnostic but my father is very Catholic and tells me he prays against them every day. Not too many months after all this started happening, a few of them I guess tried to break into his house by scratching at the windows and doors. Petrified with fear, all my father could do is pray that these things will leave him alone. They still will come during the night to try to get into his house, wiggling his door handle and looking for weak spots to enter. My father doesn't believe that these things wouldn't try and kill him, so he keeps everything securely locked. I'm really worried about him because this is still an ongoing occurrence, even as I write this to you. I've tried to get him out here to the United States, but he just doesn't want to leave his farm. I don't know what to do. Three years ago, I went on a vacation and had one of my best friends pet sit for me. At the time of this, I lived in Nevada and was taking a road trip to see a girlfriend who lived in Northern Cali at the time. I was going to be gone for a week and all was well. I should mention that prior to this, I have never had any experiences that were weird in any way, shape, or form. Life for me has been fairly normal, and I've enjoyed that until now. I don't want strange and creepy things to happen to me, but I guess you don't ask for these things, they just come to you. I had called my friend every few days just to check in to make sure that everything was okay and that my dog was doing good. I trusted my best friend and everything had gone great up until the very last day, where I didn't hear from her at all. I didn't think much of it, and when I finally got back to my house later on in the evening, and my friend was on the front porch crying, I get out of the car to greet her, and she's very visibly shaken. I try to talk to her, but she's not really responding. I can see in her eyes there's something really wrong with my dog. I asked her if my dog's okay, and she just shakes her head no, that she doesn't know what happened to her. This is when I start to panic and frantically begin asking, what do you mean you don't know? Where is she? Before totally breaking down and sobbing, she looks right at me and tells me she's dead. Before I have a mental breakdown myself, I keep begging her to tell me where she is. She finally points out back and tells me that she's there 
and that she found her dead this morning and doesn't know what got her. After running to the back with everything I had in me to only see my dog dead on the ground was one of the most heartbreaking experiences I wouldn't wish on anybody, not even my worst enemy. My dog was my best friend and it took a long while for me to ever truly get over it. I still miss her so much to this day. I thought she had gotten killed by maybe a pack of coyotes, but she wasn't mangled or bloodied in any way. In fact, she looked rather peaceful, like she had just fallen or collapsed to the ground and died. I tried to move her body around to see if I can find any reason that she would have just suddenly died. When I moved her, her neck moved and these two large holes shone right back at me. There wasn't a drop of blood, but there were clearly two puncture wounds in her neck. Both holes, I would say, roughly the size of a number two pencil. What out there makes two puncture marks in an animal's neck like this, I thought to myself. Well, in the moment, it was more of an emotional meltdown and a lot of tears than it was fear or wondering what killed my dog. Fast forward about six months, and the friend that watched my dog actually ended up moving into that same house because I actually moved to Northern Cali with my friend that I visited. We went in on a house together to roommate since it fit for both of our jobs. Me and my best friend in Nevada still stayed in very close contact. Sometimes we talked and she would try and confide in me that she's been having some strange experiences in that house. When I would ask her to elaborate more, she had mentioned that she had been hearing banging against her back windows and walls at night, and even went so far as to have a security slash surveillance system installed. Then, she went on to tell me that she had been seeing this tiny little gray person with claws trying to break into the back window. She kept saying, I know, I know, it sounds crazy, but I promise this is what's happening. I asked her if she had any of the surveillance footage to show me, and she said that the police had taken it. Shortly after she began to see this short gray humanoid with claws, she called the police, shown them the footage, and asked what was going on. I guess several other of the neighbors had been calling into the police as well, complaining about similar circumstances. That's when the police force stepped in, confiscated her entire surveillance system and her computer and hard drive. Next thing you know, I stopped getting phone calls from her, and now I can't even reach her. I haven't been able to get a hold of her in a long time. I even sent her a card not too long ago and never heard anything back. I would usually always at least get a text message or phone call, but nothing. I've been listening to your channel for months now, and I don't want to be a doomer, but everything I've heard in your stories and things that have happened to people in your stories is happening to me in real life. I feel like I'm in some sort of fictional horror story. Maybe there's more to my dog being killed than I would like to think. Maybe there's a reason the police confiscated her equipment, and God only knows what happened to her. I hope she's okay. Hi, I live out in Central Oregon. Central Oregon is a vast high desert full of rattlesnakes, punishing high temperatures, and tons upon tons of dust. However, there is so much beauty out here where I live that it makes up for all the potential dangers of living out in the desert. Coyotes can be dangerous, and I know they will kill livestock and animals and horses, but one thing I'm not sure about is creatures that suck the blood out of other animals. I'm talking vampires. Okay, well, maybe not vampires in a traditional sense because they are fictional. However, my dad and I are finding wild horses in groups and singular that are dead with multiple sets of holes along their neck and drained of all blood. I'm talking zero blood in the entire cadaver. There's no blood on the ground, and whatever poked a hole in the neck was so clean and precise. The same sets of holes can be found in the exact same locations on the other horses that we found. We have found deceased horses alone with these puncture wounds, and we have also found them in large groups, all dead. It's almost as if something walked right up to them, poked a hole in their neck, and walked away, and just let them bleed out. Except there's no blood, or evidence of any bleeding out for that matter. I'm not really sure how I'm going to explain it. It's just a weird supernatural phenomenon, because my mind goes to vampires, 
I have to stop that because it's been programmed that way because of how pop culture is. I know that vampires don't exist and that there isn't a vampire going around drinking the blood of horses. When I cannot explain is why we're finding these wild horses dead over the past couple of months all of a sudden. It's actually been about the same time that we went into quarantine, so probably late March. Yeah, I would say about two months now. I want to say we've been probably finding up to about 30 to 40 dead wild horses in total, all having their blood be drained. I know people talk about UFO stuff, alien stuff, and all that weird abduction nonsense being out in the middle of nowhere, but what even drains the blood of a horse? We are pretty close with our neighbors that are around us, and we've checked in with them. They've been experiencing strange things, but no animals being killed or any blood being drained from anything. The one connection I could piece together potentially is that in the last 60 days, not only has more wild horses been showing up dead more than ever, but the dogs around the area have gone missing. I know that because I've been asked on several occasions already if I had seen several of our neighbor's animals. Animals just meaning dogs. There are the same dogs that I've seen around the area for years. Because I've been here for so long, I've gotten to know my neighbors and people around us very well, and they've had the same animals for a long time. You know, something is up when the same animals just get up and go missing within a 60 day time span. And now, all of a sudden these horses are just dropping dead in the middle of the night? Something just doesn't add up. I've thought about calling the cops, but really, what are they gonna do? If it's somebody doing this, they're gonna get caught eventually. But I don't know. Who goes out and murders random wild horses? And you would think if they're kidnapping the dogs, wouldn't you find the dogs somewhere? I guess I'm just thinking out loud at this point. See, my dad is a stickler, just like me, and firmly stands by that it's a coyote. I'm a skeptic just as much as anybody, but even I think that's total bullshit, and that he's just being in denial about something more here. What does more even mean? That is what I'm trying to figure out. Could it be that there is some unknown animal out of the desert draining these horses' blood? Why hasn't anybody seen it? I suppose it's possible for a pack of rabid coyotes to be killing all the local dogs, but I still feel like we would find cadavers with how much my dad and I travel in the outback around here. There's always evidence of a kill. Nature is messy, and few predators go through the lengths to hide their work. Coyotes just simply aren't one of them. Even looking around the area of these horses, there is zero tracks of anything. No boot prints or paw prints. My dad just tells me I'm putting far too much of my mental energy and focus into trying to figure out what's going on. He says I should just let whatever happen happen and nature will sort itself out. I don't feel like this is an act of nature though. I feel like this is something that demands answers. Too many questions and not enough answers I guess. It's time for me to do some more homework of my own. Hi, What Lurks Beneath. I just saw your post about the new topic you're going to feature on your channel. I couldn't help but notice you had mentioned the Chupacabra, and I've been waiting for somebody that I can send my little story to, so I guess you'll be the first. This story has to do with my grandfather, and my grandfather's father, who owned big farms and ranches down in Mexico. Both of them claimed to have eaten Chupacabra meat, actually, when they were younger, as these beings were frequent visitors on the ranch. My grandfather tells me that it was commonplace to find these creatures drowned in the nearby large pond that the horses and other livestock would drink from. I thought that to be interesting. I wonder what caused them to drown. My grandfather wasn't sure, but his dad and grandfather would just take care of the creature, cut them up, and eat the meat. Said the meat had a weird consistency to it, like it was its own thing. Much the same way seafood and clam meat is still meat but it's its own thing. There was a time where these creatures became so bad to deal with that they actually had to trick all of them into going into a large barn where the other livestock was. They were somehow able to successfully trap them all inside and then burn the barn down, killing all the chupacabra inside as well as most of their livestock. My grandfathers are crazy men, and I don't mean crazy up in the head. I mean crazy like they've been through stuff 
and have mental strength and fortitude to endure. To them, it was just another part of growing up tough and living that lifestyle. When he had first mentioned the whole chupacabra thing to me, I laughed in his face, but when he sat me down and told me his stories, I was taken aback by them. Anyway, I just wanted to share with you this brief bit of information. I was going to share it with a couple of other big YouTube narrators, but I don't think any of them are really doing chupacabra focused content. Oh well, maybe your audience will appreciate my grandfather's experiences. Hello, first time posting here, so here's my story. About two years ago, my husband, my brother and I were vacationing at my family's vacation home in a rural area in western North Carolina. Our house is the last house on the top of a mountain. The nearest house can be off the front porch of the house, about 500 feet down the slope of the front house, with thick bushes and trees down the slope probably a 45 degree slope. This house is also a vacation home. No cars or visitors there the whole week that we stayed. Behind the house is a slope, straight up with very thick woods, clear to the top, for about a mile. No other houses up that way. Anyway, it was about 10.30ish at night, in May, June. We were playing cards on the front porch, bright moon, and a low lit porch light, just hanging out and we hear large footsteps coming up the mountain slope from below. We all stop and look at each other. My brother stands up and says, hello, and we wait in silence with no response. About three minutes later, I started feeling really uncomfortable. My gut was telling me to go inside. I expressed my concern and my husband and brother tell me to calm down and I agree to play another round of cards. We hear the footsteps again, clearly something on two feet. This is about eight to 10 minutes after the first footsteps. It was clearly closer this time, and we all stand and peer over the edge of the porch. We all see a tall figure standing on two legs, looking quite tall, about 30 to 40 feet away. It's very dark, and can't see any features other than large shoulders and a dark outline of whatever it was, and it smelt like crap, like a bear but worse. My husband runs inside and grabs his gun while my brother and I back up and stand in the doorway. 10 seconds later, my husband comes out back onto the porch in the front and he says, hey, is there someone out there? I have a gun, please let us know if someone's there. No answer. About two minutes of silence goes by, and we all have a feeling of straight up dread. It's not longer visible where it originally was, and we never heard another movement from it. We retreated inside once we all agreed that we felt extremely uncomfortable. My brother claims to have heard tapping on the walls that night while trying to sleep, but my husband and I didn't hear a thing. Let me know what you guys think it could have been. We have seen dogs, mountain lion, and bobcats on this property, but never anything else as far as large animals go. I'm happy to elaborate the best I can if somebody wants more of an explanation. About seven years ago, I saw three apparitions appear and evaporate before my eyes. I was sitting in my car around two to three in the morning waiting for my friend to come out of their house. Something caught my attention in my peripheral, crossing the street in front of my car. There was no one out due to the time. I didn't have my headlights on, just some ambient lights from my car stereo. I saw a man walk in front of my car, made up of what I can only describe as white smoke. It was almost like a body made of fog with an image projected onto it. He glided smoothly across the street, but I can make out the details of Boots. I could not see his face. It was hard to make out any details of him, though he was so close to me. 
He never looked in my direction, just straight ahead. As I was watching him, completely confused to what I was seeing, I saw two more apparitions also crossing the street. They were at least two to three houses away. The male figure was directly in front of my car. I would say he was only three to four feet away from me. Your mind can't really make sense of what you're seeing. You don't really feel fear, it was more complete bafflement. As he got to the middle of the street, he literally started to disappear in front of my eyes. From his head down, like steam evaporating, he was merely a torso with legs by the time he reached the middle of the street. I was completely frozen, confused. I have had strange experiences, heard plenty of creepy noises, strange presences felt over the years, but I had never seen an apparition of any kind before. As I was watching him slowly evaporate, he walked directly into a parked truck on the opposite side of the street and disappeared completely. At that very moment, when my mind was completely upside down with trying to make sense of what I just saw, the music in my car went completely silent. The whole stereo just shut off. That is when I actually got scared. It immediately got my attention off of what I just saw. I was frantically hitting the power button, off and on. Still, no sound. I had been listening to a CD at the time and can tell you exactly what song was playing when it all happened. I ejected the CD, put it back in, changed tracks, still no sound. As I was hitting every button on my stereo, I finally went for the volume knob. It had been turned completely to the left, muting the stereo. It was an analog control, so it had to be physically turned all the way to the left. That was when I went from confused to terrified. Whatever I had just experienced, witnessed with my own two eyes, had just become a full-on poltergeist and turned off my stereo. Was it trying to distract me, to draw my attention away from something I wasn't meant to see? Was it trying to cement the experience so I couldn't try to explain it away later? Our minds desperately try to make sense of things that don't really fit into our realities. With everything I saw and experienced that night, there is no rational explanation for any of it. That experience still completely haunts me, but I have zero doubt in my mind that apparitions, whatever they are, are real, and also have an intelligence, an intent. There is no way you can truly convey an experience like that to another person. You can only truly believe in the supernatural when it presents itself directly to you. Over the years, I have analyzed every detail of what I had experienced. Did I see ghosts? Did I witness a strange glitch in time? A portal, perhaps? I even analyzed what song I was listening to at the time. It was actually a cover song by Atlas Sound of Joe Meek. Meek was a pioneer in experimental music in the 1960s, and I had been a fan of his music for quite a while at that point. It wasn't until this experience that I decided to read more about Joe Meek and his life. It turns out in 1967, he murdered his landlady and then shot himself with a shotgun. I had no clue about any of that tragedy or anything about Joe Meek's personal life with the exception of his music and his influence on experimental production. When I read about the murder slash suicide, I cannot help but feel that the apparitions were connected to the music I was playing, and to those deaths. Though the tragedy took place in England, and my experience was in LA, I would love to hear of any of your thoughts about this or similar experiences. This happened when I was really young. I was around six to nine years old. A little backstory. I had a significant trauma happen to me when I was six years old. I don't want to go into details, but it made my life really difficult for a while. I totally shut down for a bit, and sleep at time was my only safe haven. For the next couple of years after my incident, my dreams just got stranger and stranger. I at first only saw them in the background of my dreams, like part of the scenery almost. Then I began to have lucid dreams. All of a sudden, 
these dark shadow people with red eyes began to manifest in my room. I never felt danger from them, and that gave me a sense of relief. I would talk to them like they were someone I knew, and I would tell them about my day. A lot of times, these conversations would end because they would hear something and move off my bed. I would go wake from my semi-asleep state by trying to go after them. Towards the end of my encounters with these creatures, I got a sense of terror and I can never pinpoint it until one night a white figure came through my door and reached out with a knife toward me. I woke up with a jolt and never saw any of them again, though I will sometimes see one of them dart out of my vision. This story was told to me by my auntie. She is from Del Morto, the northern rim of Canyon de Chile. Job security and job availability is scarce and almost non-existent on the Navajo Nation. There were no jobs in the nearby communities or towns. Like many residents of the Navajo Nation, she had to find work off the res in border towns. She had been hired by the power plant in Page, Arizona. Depending on the night shift or day shift, she would have to leave home at odd hours to make it to work on time. She explained that she would drive to Page by way of going to a similar town, then to another town, followed by yet another town, and then finally Page. One time, she had to leave very early in the morning hours, shortly after midnight. She figured that she would just make it to Page and sleep in her vehicle until her shift had started. She was the owner of one of those late 1980s, early 90s Astro vans. The ones with the huge bump it type of things on top. It was the definition of a res ride. No air conditioning, busted up, and if you drove faster than 60 miles an hour, it would start shaking. She said somewhere on the desolate stretch of desert road, between a few of the towns, she started to feel uneasy. The uneasiness wasn't a slow creeping feeling. It was a sudden surge of anguish. She quickly searched the rear view mirrors and scanned the horizon for other vehicles or streetlights from NHA housings that speckled the landscape in certain areas, searching for some type of familiarity to soothe her uneasiness. No luck. She tried turning the knob on the AM FN radio in search of any form of radio stations. Still no luck. As her focus darted onto the roadway from fidgeting with the radio, something caught the corner of her gaze. The headlights illuminated the figure on the shoulder of the pavement. As she drove past the area, she said it smelt like roadkill, very pungent. She described it as a mountain lion with an unusual silhouette. As she drove past the figure, she realized in the passenger side rearview mirror that Whatever it was gave way to pursuit. The black mass with the silhouette of an odd mountain lion was running alongside the van. She gripped the wheel firmly with sweaty palms and floored the gas pedal. As the van began to accelerate, the wheel started to vibrate turbulently. She watched as the figure fell back and cut across the backside of the van and was stalking the driver's side. She began to pray in Navajo the speedometer indicated that she was reaching 60 miles an hour, a detail she already had come to the conclusion due to the turbulence of the vehicle. The skinwalker began to pick up speed and start to overtake the vehicle. She didn't want whatever it was to make it in front of the vehicle. Her explanation was that she didn't want to see what it was in full beams of the headlights. She figured she would faint or drive off the road if she saw the details of the skinwalker. So as a gut reaction, due to the fear, she veered to the left. She hears a huge thud and the steering wheel jerks out of her hands momentarily, but she safely regains control of the wheel. The loud thump and scraping can be heard along the entire undercarriage of the van. Her logical thought process kicks in. She is not sure what she hit, but her instincts tell her to slow down and assess the damage made to the van to check if she can safely make it to Page without incident or leaking fluid. She turns on her hazard lights and parks in the middle of the road. With a bright LED storm light type flashlight, she hesitantly exits the cab of the vehicle. She checks the tires, the grill, 
underneath the grill, not exactly sure what she was looking for. The smell of roadkill is still very pungent and present. She checks the rear of the vehicle. She is covering her mouth and nose with her sleeve because the smell was so bad. Curiosity gets the best of her, and she points the flashlight down the roadway. Before the light of the flashlight illuminates whatever she hit, she hears a woman screaming for help. It sounded like an old lady. She said in the middle of the road there was a bloodied mountain lion pelt and a wrinkled bloody lady. From what she could see, she said the old lady was naked but covered in blood. She said she hauled ass back to the van, still hearing the shrieks of the skinwalker. She said that she yelled back in Navajo, something to the translation of, that's why you should have just left me alone. You did this to yourself. She makes it to Paige with no further incidents as the sun is rising. So, I rarely have nightmares, or ones that I can remember, but I notice that whatever I do, it always circles back to witches. Witches that turned into owls and watched me as I slept. Witches putting curses on family members in my old childhood home as I watched, trying to wake them up as their body broke and contorted. The disfigured witch muttering out words, never breaking eye contact with my relative as I tried to wake them up. The most recent one I had was a couple of days ago. I was driving along an expressway with my dog in the seat beside me. She had somehow opened the car door, so I had to exit the highway and pull over to the side of the road. I climbed in the back seat without getting off and shut it off. When I closed the door, I looked out the window and saw a van on the opposite side of the road, a little ahead of me. I remember being confused since it was out in the middle of nowhere. Tall grass, almost swampy ground as far as you can see. Then I see a bloodied woman run out to the middle of the road. She may have looked towards my car, I can't remember. I sat in the back seat of my car as I saw something dark and huge rush out and tackle her to the pavement. Long claw-like nails ripped her open as it hunched over her. I was frozen in the back seat until my dog saw what I was seeing and started to loudly growl and bark at it. The noise must have attracted the creature because it stopped and looked at me. Every cell in my body froze. It stood up and I got a better look at its body. Limbs so thin and long they dragged on the floor, hollowed out black slits for eyes, face obscured by dark matted hair or fur that swayed with each movement. It took a step forward, and I bolted to the front seat, jumping over the middle console and locking the doors before I swerved the car back and drove off, leaving the creature and torn apart woman in the middle of nowhere. It took a step forward, and I bolted to the front seat, jumping over the middle console and locking the doors before I swerved the car back and drove off, leaving the creature and torn apart woman in the middle of nowhere. I drove and drove and drove until I couldn't ignore my empty gas tank anymore. I pulled into a gas station and got off into the store. When I came back out, I froze as I saw someone looking at the back of my car. I immediately rushed over, nerves still frayed from the encounter with the creature. I angrily yelled at them to get away from my car. Did you, did you see this? They asked me, and I was confused, since I had no idea what they were talking about. Walking over, I saw something jammed under the back of my car. Kneeling down, I reached out and pulled it out. It was a bundle of twigs, wrapped in some sort of fabric with feather and carvings tied and etched into it. The person was still standing near me in my car and said, Witches. And then I woke up, kind of in a panic and disoriented. I had been taking melatonin the last couple of days, so I know that they can make my dreams a lot more vivid, and I can remember a lot about them. Almost like I'm watching a movie in my sleep. So that's why there's more detail in this last nightmare. I don't really know why I keep on dreaming about disfigured witches, and I don't know if the creature in my dreams was a witch or a wendigo slash skinwalker, because when I try and remember what it looked like, 
it resembles what I think they look like. I've always had a fear of witchcraft since I'm Hispanic, and that kind of just comes with it, at least in my family. But I've just noticed an increase of these nightmares in the last maybe two years. The family member being cursed, and this last one, the owl one I've had forever. Thirty-seven years ago, my mother and I saw an entity outside looking in at us through the window. It was hairless, pale, white, huge bulging black eyes, and it had teeth that were very small, very well spaced, skinny, and pointed, almost kind of like an anglerfish. We hid for hours until we heard my father drive towards the house. We both looked out the window to see the being the stand up from behind a wall. It was much taller than a human, and it was hiding behind the wall, and I believe waiting for us to come outside. My father drove up the driveway, and we saw the silhouette of its body from the back. It was hunched over, staring at the car. My father saw it in the headlights and what it looked like perfectly. He drove at it, and it ran away into the brush around the house. It never made a sound, and it seemed smart but cautious and the overwhelming feeling I got that night that it was vicious and violent. My parents spoke with police as we were so horrified about the encounter. After speaking to police or KGB, we were relocated and forced to never speak of the event to anyone. Within 30 hours, I was living in a new home, nearly 100 kilometers away. I have searched for so many years for an explanation. I've spoken with government officials, and I've interviewed with people who lived near our home, and then about 10 years ago. I have no answers. If people might speak with me, my messages of your comments would be constructive. I would appreciate some open-minded conversation. Okay, some more tales from my haunted childhood. As a young teen, I just refused to sleep at normal hours especially on weekends. Why? Well, that's because the house I lived in and the land the house was on was haunted as shit. Staying up usually meant seeing some freaky stuff, and growing up in a small English town, well, that's as exciting as life got. So, one night when I was around 14, I was staying up, staring at my window, when I started seeing glowing blue and purple lights coming from the forest behind my house. We don't have fireflies where I live, at least I didn't think. I thought they were so cool, so I just continued staring at them, trying to figure out what they were. Now, the way my house was set up, my bedroom window faced the forest and my back garden, and directly next to my room is a side gate that links to the front part of the house. On either side of the gates are motion sensor lights. So, the lights in the forest may not have been paranormal, but what happened next most definitely was. The motion at the front of the gate triggers, casting a faint light into my garden. The night grows really silent, no more owls or crickets, and is just really eerie. The lights in the same forest seem to ebb and flow, and then just die out. I listen carefully as I start to hear scuttling on the wood of the gate. It's muffled, so I slightly crack open my window to get a better look and listen. Now that gate is always locked, with a heavy-ass padlock at that. To this day, I have asked my dad if he has ever left the gate unlocked that night, and he stands by the fact that unless he's gardening, the gate stays closed. This was spring, so he might have started seeding, so for my own comfort of mind, I'm going to assume he left the gate open. Anyway. I hear the gate slowly swing open. The creaks of the wood were so loud against the silent night, so the sound was very distinctive. The motion light right underneath my bedroom window switches on. Honestly, to this day, I can't really explain what I saw. It was this off-white, veiny kind of skin texture and was about the size of a child. It walked on all fours and looked just sickly. Its hind legs were significantly longer than its front legs, and it looked to have hand-like claws. I hate having to link back to creepypasta, but it honestly looked like the rake. Now, I've gone through the possibilities in my head, 
Trust me, it was too small to be the deer that frequented our garden. Also, it had no remotely deer-like features. A badger or fox with a disease? Possible. However, I have never seen badgers or foxes with such long limbs and so disproportionate. Also, this thing was completely hairless and very human-like. The worst part about it to me was how it slowly and silently moved up to my garden path before disappearing into the woods. The noises of the night started back up after that, but I was so shook up that I didn't sleep that entire night. I'm from England, so I haven't heard of any folklore that matches what I saw. I know there were occult practices done in the woods behind my house, but I'm pretty sure it was pagan, hence not inherently bad or demonic. I don't know what I saw, honestly. Any ideas?